I'm amazing. amazing. Yeah, I'm all that. If I ain't on my grind, then what you call that? Victorious. Yeah, we warriors. We make history. Strive all victory. Standing there for Thank you, everyone, uh, for, for, for inviting me on, uh, for, for inviting me along on the rainy day in Harlow. Um, what I was going to say is that um, when we kind of look at the Middle East, it's quite easy to kind of see uh, this kind of big chaos that's taking place and you're trying to make sense of what's happening. And we're presented with a whole series of what seem to be quite complex questions, quite emotional questions, like the question of Libya, what we're seeing now with Syria, and so on, which can, uh, which can kind of give the impression that uh, there's kind of two... Uh, is the, there's two kind of faces of the Middle East. One is this kind of severe repression, where nobody says anything, and the other part of it is suddenly everyone's having revolutions. Uh, in the middle of all these revolutions, there's all this kind of chaotic, um, uh, all, all this uh, uh, kind of chaos and all these forces thrown up and so on. But what, what I want to do is, is, is try and place the, the wave of revolutions in the Middle East in, 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 in the context of imperialism, understanding what is imperialism and, and, and what does it mean for, uh, for the Middle East, but I think also really important how things have changed. I think it's very important to understand how things have changed, not only over the last 30 years, but actually over the last few years. And, 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 and it's just, the, the first thing I want to say is that imperialism is, uh, you, it, it starts off as the export, what they call the export of capital, that is, that you, a country, a rich country like Britain, for example, or the US or, <coughs> or China, it doesn't really matter, uh, attempts to conquer other markets in order to use their markets, A, to sell their goods, but B, also to extract from these places uh, uh, um, oil or coal or, or wood or, 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 or whatever natural resources that they are. And this relationship usually involves the more dominant power subjugating uh, 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 the, 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 uh, the country that they're after, usually militarily. And so when we see, when we talk about imperialism, we usually see invasions, there's usually, uh, this is, most of the time it tends to be a local <coughs> strong man, as they call him, or a di dictator who works on behalf of this foreign power and so on. So there is, if you like, the Middle East has been the magnet for imperial powers, imperialist powers, and imperialist rivalry. So it's not simply a question of one so a power like Britain or France having influence in the Middle East, but actually all of them fight over it. So you have, over the years, over the, over the last century, a battle between France and Britain over control of the Middle East, a battle between France, Britain and Russia at one point, Italy got involved in it at one point, then, then the US obviously came in, and now we can look at the Middle East, we can see the rise of Chinese influence uh, and, 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 and all, that, and all, that, all of that, that means. In the centre of it, we have to understand the main kind of uh, uh, the, the main goal of imperial conquest in the Middle East is, of course, control over oil. The oil in the Middle East is the cheapest. That is, you stick a pipe in the ground and it pumps out. It's of relatively good quality, what they call sweet crude. So it's, it's, it's easier to process and cheap and so on. And uh, uh, therefore, control over the oil is very, very important. But also, not only to control the oil, but to deny your rival control of the oil is also very important. So when the US, for example, uh, 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 moved into Saudi Arabia, one of the things they were doing when they moved to Saudi Arabia was to deny their main competitors at the time, Britain and France, control over Saudi oil. And the same with how Britain took over, uh, took control of, of Iraq and how uh, France took, took control of Syria. And so imperial, so the oil is I think the main thing that they're after, but there's other things also in the Middle East. It's strategic location. If you think of the Suez Canal, which cuts through Egypt, uh, as being for for British imperialism, especially you know uh, up, to, up to quite recently, the main route to the Far East, therefore the main route to India and so on. So most of British goods either went through the Suez Canal or uh, 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 went went out of the Suez Canal. It, it, it was really both ways. So you have to understand it's also strategic. Suez Canal is very very important, but then the whole region as well is uh, uh, you know at, at the top of Africa. It's, uh, it, it's, uh, it, it opens all the way uh, uh, to, uh, um, in, into the Far East, into Turkey and so on. So strategically, it's about uh, uh, oil, but it's also about uh, the Suez Canal, and it's also about generally where it lies between Europe and so on. So it's, taking control of the Middle East has been uh, something the imperialism has been after since Napoleon. 
And Napoleon was the first one, I think, of the modern era, who, when he invaded Egypt, it was about taking control of Egypt and denying Egypt to the, the British. And there was battles between the British and the French over it, and, and so on. So we have to kind of understand it as not simply being oil, but also being extraordinarily, uh, extraordinarily uh, strategic. So if we think of the Suez Canal being in the middle of Egypt, you can understand why Egypt is important if you understand that something like 5% of global trade passes through the Suez Canal and just about everything produced in China going to the European market passes through the Suez Canal. So for China, Suez Canal is very, very important. Also for the European Union, the Suez Canal is very, very important. Actually, if you go to the Suez at the moment, you will see factories opening up all along the, 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 the canal, mainly Chinese factories, high-end consumer goods and so on, to feed the European market. So what's happening in Egypt is of great concern, not simply to mm -hmm. the European Union, it's actually petrifying, terrifying Chinese ruling class as well. And China is moving much, much, uh, uh, moving into the Middle East in a very, very big way. So there is a whole series of shifts and changes uh, that, that, that have taken place in every single country. Therefore, is an important prize to take control of this important prize. This means that the Middle East has been fought over over the last century and a half by these rival powers, and, and, uh, and, and, and this creates this has created inside the Middle East this uh, uh, this this huge tension and this constant uh, this constantly sh sh shifting tension. So, what is the dominant power? What has been the dominant power in the Middle East uh, over the last since 1967? Has been the U.S. Has been the Americans, and we have to understand. When the Americans came into the Middle East, they came in with the language of anti-colonialism. So uh, my village in North Lebanon, for example, my grandmother has kept uh, a donation from the American people, and it's a, a friendship. It was a tin of rice, a friendship, between the American and the Middle East people. And so I said to my grandmother, you know, why are you keeping this? You know, why do you want to show this? And she goes, oh, because then the Americans were good. They, they wanted to get rid of the French, they were anti-colonial and so on, so we liked the Americans. And, and as the Americans then drove the British and the French out, they then became the dominant imperial power and everyone started burning American flags. Before that, they weren't. And so you can begin to see how, how, how important it is. Actually, when we look at American imperialism, we have to understand a couple of things. First of all, uh, from the 1990s, there was this idea this, uh, uh, going through the neocons and the uh, more right-wing and aggressive section of the American ruling class, which says that they wanted to create something called the New American Century. That is, they wanted to re, uh, we want to tell the world how powerful they were. And to do this, they uh, invaded Afghanistan and they invaded Iraq. And these were, if you like, an attempt to project their power inside the Middle East. Uh, if people remember in the in the lead up to the, the invasion of both Iraq and Afghanistan, they will they will know that that how on the front foot the Americans were, how aggressive they were, how uh, even though it almost would kind of like massive illusions they had in their own abilities and so on. Um, and people can, and we can talk about that period up to 2001, 2002, 2003 as being one dominated by this kind of new strategic push by the Americans to show their power. Because <laughs> understand something that has happened is they lost the war in Iraq and they're losing the war in Afghanistan. So instead of the Americans projecting their power, what they've essentially done is projected their weakness. So when you look even at Iraq, and we were arguing at the time, the main reason they went into Iraq is to get the oil, seize the oil fields and so on. They did this big invasion, they couldn't control the country. All the new, all the new oil contracts are not going to the Americans. All the new oil contracts are going to the Chinese. If you want to look at the, the rebuilding of the port of Beirut, which was originally given to the Americans, it's now been handed over to the Chinese. The whole of the Algerian uh, oil infrastructure is being rebuilt by the Chinese. And you can see, actually, the, the, that the shift in powers in, uh, uh, in, 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 inside the Middle East, actually, we can talk about a severe weakening of US imperialism, the weakening of the dominant power that has been there for, uh, for, for, for a while. So I think that's really important that we start from that point. And I understand that we're not in 2002, 2003. We're almost in a kind of, uh, people remember the kind of Vietnam syndrome. Uh, after Vietnam, the Americans found it very difficult to go in everywhere else. You can almost start talking about the Afghan syndrome and the Iraqi syndrome. Is that there is a fear of them get, getting too involved uh, because they see uh, that they don't understand what's happening and so on. So, so that is the kind of first change. Really important, the rise of China, the de relative decline of the US, economically China becoming much, much more important than the US. There is a kind of tradition in SWP meetings where we, we throw this question out and say, oh, you know, what is the, which country receives the, the highest amount of USA? And everyone shouts out Israel. And then we say, what's the second question? 
What's the second country that receives the highest? Man, everyone shouts out Egypt, right? Which is true, it was true up until recently. The Americans pump in 1.5 billion into Egypt. To, you know, I'm, I'm the Husni Mubarak, they're still trying to do it now. In 2001, the Chinese invested 500 million in Egypt. It's now 12.5 billion, projected to go to 24 billion in a few years' time. So actually, the relative decline mm -hmm. economically of the US and the rise of China means that the that the, 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 the Americans are in a much weaker position, even though militarily still very strong, still capable of doing lots of damage, than they were before. Um, all the massive infrastructure, infrastructure changes are happening, are happening for the Chinese and so on. So, so, so we, can really make, we can really make this point that we have to understand that the Middle East, pre-revolution, the Americans were in deep, deep trouble. Very, very big trouble. Um, and, and that's really important that we, that, 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 that we understand that to understand then what, 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 what has happened since. Now, of course, since the, the fall of Hosni Mubarak, there's been another very significant change inside the Middle East, which is a wave of revolutions. And if we think about what these revolutions mean, especially to imperialism, where we understand how, how, how they've taken even a, 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 a huge blow to them. For the start off, you have to think about who they lost. So they lost Ben Ali in Tunisia, who's mainly an ally of France, but still very important to the Americans. And then lost Hosni Mubarak, the most important, one of the most important figures. They then lost uh, 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 the, the, the dictator in Yemen. Uh, Bahrain is in a state of almost constant revolution. Um, it's, if, you, if you look in Kuwait, and if people think of Kuwait as being this tiny place that, with lots of oil that everybody keeps invading and having big wars on, there is a huge strike wave that's taking place in Kuwait, which is almost unprecedented. So when you look in Kuwait, you saw a strike wave that started with the oil workers, then went into the port authority, then went into the teachers, and, and I remember at the time thinking how extraordinary this was, because every time you hear about Kuwait, it's either you know, someone invading or someone running away. The idea that now Kuwait is seen as being the center of trade unionism inside the Arab world gives you a sense of actually how much, how, how, how much it should. So these wave of revolutions <coughs> have gone through the Middle East and have, in a space of really very short space, I'm going to four or five months, removed very important key placement of the US imperialism inside the region. So coming into uh, 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 so, so this, this, this new year, not only have they lost important wars and are trying to extract themselves from Afghanistan, but they're also now facing these revolutionary waves which they are finding extraordinarily difficult to deal with and so on. And I think it's, if, if we think of it in those terms, then we can then look at other significant changes that, that have taken place. And I, I always put it this way, I grew up in Lebanon um, well, uh, in, in the 1960s and, and the early 1970s. And in Lebanon, in that, in that time, something like 75% of the population lived in the, in, on the land. We were farmers, so my family were peasants and so on. We lived in our villages, we were pretty much isolated. Some of the new middle classes would go to the cities and so on. And you, and you, and, and you look at this across the whole of the Middle East, and you look into Saudi Arabia, and you look into Oman, and you look into Yemen. These are all big agricultural societies, really, to be sure. Even Saudi Arabia, which was based, most of the populations were based in the, in the larger oases and so on. The idea of it being urban was completely, uh, you know, it just, it just wasn't there. Cities were small things. Now, if you look at the Middle East, there has been a huge shift. So if you think of Lebanon now, 90% of the population are urban. 70% of which live in Beirut or Greater Beirut. Saudi Arabia, 85% of the population are now urban. They live in Riyadh and in Jeddah and all the big cities in the east. Even little Oman, which has kind of not really been in the news, a massive wave of urbanization. So there's been, if you like, this huge social shift that has taken place in which the old peasantry is now no longer there. It's now urban working class, poor middle class, you know, low, low, low middle class, and so on. And even if you look in Syria, just over the last three years, Three million Syrians, our population of 27 million, have moved from the countryside into the big cities. This is one of the driving forces of, the, of, of this revolution. So huge cities like Aleppo are now have 22 new neighborhoods made up of people coming from the countryside into the cities. So everywhere you look in the Middle East, you now talk about it being urban societies. This is a change really the last 10, 15 years you can talk about it.